All right, this is the Friendly Bear Podcast. This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long. Um, I'm here with Edwin Dorsey of the Bear Cave Newsletter. Um, Edwin runs a news, a weekly newsletter that's free, but also he has a paid subscription. Um, and it provides analysis, commentary of curated links in the short world. Every Monday, the free newsletter covers new activist short campaigns, SEC enforcement actions, and shares us some exclusive research and share some inclusive research that's uh, off his website but yeah edwin how you doing yeah so let's let's see what's going on with the bear cave david i'm doing great thanks so much for having me on the friendly bear podcast i'm really excited to be here and uh i write the bear cave newsletter so we're great both bears. <laughs> yeah go bears um now what brought me to your what brought your attention or how you say what brought anyways what got me interested in your newsletter was seeing you like a couple of years ago uh with these interviews with some big activist short sellers on, on like randomly through through youtube i think and yeah. uh and i dug it i found i think you were pretty new at the time and um i saw your twitter profile and you were like you were in stanford at the time and i started looking into it because i i like i like the the research guy I, I try to keep updated with the the main research guys in the, the short um genre and um yeah i looked into you, you seem like a, like a like a really smart smart guy you know writing up like real detailed research and really interested in the short world getting the big interviews like with carson block marco hodes and some others and it was just i was like wow this this young guy really really has some talent over here like, he's got a future and then marco hodes like um you had some really good material really good questions and interviews on, on YouTube, you know, so whoever, whoever's here should go check out those YouTube videos. My favorite one personally is Owen Cars Block about the China, uh, yeah, the China frauds and all that China, yeah. whole China issues. But yeah, um, Edwin, so what got you started in research companies, in researching companies? So, so David, I've been passionate about stocks from a really young age. Like in second grade, I, I was poking around the stock market. My grandmother put a little bit of her money in an E-Trade account and gave me the username and password and told me I could invest it for her. And that's a lot of fun at a young age playing with a little bit of real money. Uh, so I got hooked really young. Um, what made me transition to the short side, though, was freshman year of college. I got introduced by a mutual friend to Mark Cajodes and I Ubered up to his, he has a chicken farm in Northern California. And I met with him for like two hours and he was telling me about short selling, and how he digs deep into these companies and how sometimes he can spark change and get in all these battles. And, and that really got me hooked. And by coincidence, uh, one month later, I met Jim Carruthers who runs Sophos Capital Management, which is a large short only hedge fund like two miles from Stanford campus. Uh, and, and he was very nice and took an interest in me. And I entered for Sophos on and off for my four years of college. So, so that's kind of how I learned the short world is through him. Um, uh, I also engaged in a mini activist campaign with this public company called care.com that got me a little bit of attention on Twitter. But that's how it really started is Mark Cahotas and Jim Carruthers like, you know, both mentored me, helped me draw a Twitter presence, showed me the, the roadmap to researching companies. And then from that, when I graduated, I used the Twitter to start a newsletter and get people to sign up. And it, it's taken off since then. Right, so, so what year in college were you? This is in Stanford, right? What year? Well, so freshman year when I met them and then sophomore year when I started writing about care.com, which is how i started to get some attention it's from care.com okay it's not like a like a babysitting service or something like that it, exactly that, that... david so care.com <laughs> it was the largest babysitting platform in the u.s at the time i was writing about them they were publicly traded on the new york stock exchange like 800 million dollar company and the problem with the company is they claim to be vetting babysitters and doing safety checks on babysitters. And that's important for a babysitting platform. Yeah, you want yeah. babysitters to be safe and not criminals and to be vetted. And I, I had a friend who was on there who said, hey, this company seems a little sketchy. You should check them out. And I immediately saw there was a lot of lawsuits against care.com, a lot of local media reporting. And what I did to try to test their safety screening is I tried to sign up as Harvey Weinstein. 
I used Harvey Weinstein's photo. I made up an address. I made up a biography for Harvey Weinstein. I put in a fake social security number, fake birthday, everything. Wow. And, you know, you can send to a background check. And at the end of the application process, care.com is like, we'll get back to you within 48 hours on whether or not you're approved for the website. And I'm like, okay, there's no way they approve Harvey Weinstein. This, this is an obviously fake yeah. account. 48 hours later, they approved me. And I'm on care.com with like a check mark and an approved babysitter. Oh God, yeah. as Harvey Weinstein. And I get upgraded to one of their levels of authenticity. And it's just like, and, and that's what really like, I'm like, there's a problem here. Um, and long story short, I started publishing about it while I was at Stanford. The company called Stanford to complain about me, um, which was really funny. At one point, they sent a private investigator to my house. Uh, wow. I, I, I worked a lot on them. And then after I put out some reports, the Wall Street Journal ended up running a front page story about the safety issues at care.com. And the CEO, CFO, and general counsel all resigned, the stock slides. And eventually IAC acquires care.com at a big discount. And, and the good thing is IAC did set up, step up the safety practices and put it in a new board and really focus on safety to make the company better and safer for its users. I got you. So how, how did the Wall Street Journal get a hold of it to like blast it out while they were while care.com was trying to suppress it? Because they were sending investigators after out of you after you and uh, all that. So how did they how did the good guys get a hold of it? <laughs> So after I wrote one of my articles on care.com, I literally cold emailed probably a hundred journalists plus. Um, and, and a few responded, including the Wall Street Journal. And, um, and I, I think they do outstanding works. They were of course able to find a lot more than what I found. Um, so, so I have a huge respect for the Wall Street Journal team. And I, I think their story catalyzed a lot of change that I wasn't able to do as a young Stanford student. But, but it showed me like, you know, yeah. digging in and exposing, me, it can make a real difference. Like, you know, because of these safety changes, like, you know, a lot less of this bad stuff associated with Care.com is happening in the world now. And that's what kind of excites me so much about the activist short selling compared to um, normal like investing is you can really make a difference in the world if you do it the right way and are intellectually honest and uh, gain respect. Um, you can change things. Yeah, and and what gave you the what made you have the the aha the, to like go ahead and make the Harvey Weinstein like that's like the, that was probably the worst guy at the time, right? He was the, yeah, the Hollywood this mogul. Was, this was when Harvey Weinstein was in the news. Uh, I was I was explaining this to like you know a friend. And the friend is like, I, and I was thinking, how can I test like um, whether or not they're actually vetting people? And I was like, maybe I can like find a former felon and try to like see if they'd sign up with my consent and like document it. And it was, I, he's like, no, it would be much easier just to try as like a Harvey Weinstein or something. Um, and, and that made a lot more sense. So it was a friend's suggestion. And I, it, it worked great because it's something people can really grasp. It's one yeah. thing to say, oh, they're not, the, it's another thing to say, hey, they're like, they approved Harvey Weinstein. It's and really clear. That, yeah, that, that's a, that's <laughs> How did that end with a check mark and everything? That's, in, that's crazy. All right, so what got you attracted to the bear side? Okay, so you had these activist short sellers show you the ropes, but uh, were you convinced right away I got to be a bear? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I sometimes joke with people if my two early mentors were microcap, the best people in the microcap world, I'd be here talking about microcaps. If my two early mentors were private equity people, then I'd be talking about private equity. But it just so happened that my two great early mentors freshman year were some of the best short sellers and short minds out there. So yeah, uh, I yeah. got drawn to short selling. Absolutely. Okay, so how would you describe yourself as a market player? Short seller activist or you, do, you, do you trade at all or? So, so what, one thing that people don't really know is even though I put out these critical reports on companies and a lot of con people consider me a short guy who knows all these short sellers, I don't short stocks. My, I don't trade. I don't bet against the companies I write about. Um, I, I, I do stuff on the long side. More recently, I take most of my net worth is in Twitter stock. And I've highlighted that as a stock that I think is good to bear cave paid subscribers. Um, 
So, but I don't do much on the short side and I never bet against companies that I, I write about. And if I did, that would be clearly disclosed. Um, but, but yeah, so on the long side, I, I do a lot in tech. Um, I do some micro cap stuff, but nothing too crazy. You know, I, I think shorting generally is best for the bigger funds because you go short to get more long. Um, if you look at the best short sellers like Jim Chanos, I, I think, you know, they annualize maybe positive returns of 1% a year from short selling. It's just really difficult to make money at running a short book, but, but it's a lot easier to um, break even and then get more long the S&P or other stocks and, and make up a difference there. If you have an even short book, but can go extra long a stock that goes up 10%. Absolutely. Okay, so what made you want to start the Bear Cave newsletter? Uh, so, so it was a bunch of things. I wanted to be in New York City post-graduation, and I was talking to a lot of the New York City hedge funds, and they're all very nice. Um, but most hedge funds are very structured and top-down, where a boss is giving you assignments on what to do. Most require a lot of modeling skills. I've never been a big fan of modeling, or definitely that's one of my weak areas. Um, you, I, and I just didn't feel, I felt like these would be fine places to work, but I didn't really find one that I was like, I would love to work here. Um, so, so I just started the newsletter more as a way in the early days to keep in touch with people and network and share my thoughts and just keep up with the going as ons of the short world. But when it started to grow and when I saw other Substack newsletters starting to be successful, I, I'm like, maybe I'll give it a shot at going paid. And the moment I turned on paid subscriptions, it just started growing like a rocket. I, I, I think like the CEO reached a Substack reached out to me and said, hey, you're one of the fastest growing email newsletters we've ever seen. Like, what are you doing? And then I knew like, okay, I can, I can earn more doing this. I can have a lot more fun doing this, a lot more freedom doing this. I'll network more doing this. Uh, uh, you know, it's kind of the perfect job for a 23 year old because I can sleep in if I want to. No one's telling me the schedule. No one's yelling yeah. at me. I, I, I can take a few days off if I want to, you know, <laughs> waste some time. Um, so, so uh, it's a dream job, honestly. Yeah. I like the way you highlight the, um, what, what gave you the initial success in your Twitter. Like you put like the little pointers, like little bullet points of like answer, the emails quickly, um, how you how you grew it, you kind of highlighted it in your Twitter, and it's it's very you put everything very clear out there to kind of be very transparent of what you're doing. It's it's, it's yeah yeah it's great it's great. Um, all right, so how much research goes into putting out a report? So for paid subscribers, uh, there's a report on the first and third Thursday of every month. So basically, two a month. Um, uh, those can vary a lot and they can vary in quality because if you're putting out a lot, occasionally you're just not going to have an outstanding report. And you'll have a mediocre report. And my approach is always you need to be intellectually honest. And as long as you're intellectually honest, subscribers will understand if not everything's a home run. It can vary though to, from 10 hours to 100 hours. Um, it, usually if I get excited about an idea, it can be a lot longer because I'll read every lawsuit ever filed against the company. I'm very document based, so I'll read the SEC filings. I'll I'll watch, you know, listen to the company's earnings calls. And one of my strengths, one of my favorite things to do, is file file FOIA requests. Um, for people who don't know, FOIA stands for the Freedom of Information Act, and, and largely it allows any U.S. citizen to request information, government records from the government, uh, and you can use these in innovative ways to like learn more about companies. My favorite way is to read consumer complaints. So I read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of consumer complaints filed against companies um, that I obtained through the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, and, and that is hugely informative because I'll think a company is operating unethically. I'll, I'll send FOIA requests for consumer complaints and there just sometimes won't be that many. Other times the company seems like you know, a little wishy-washy case, I'll send a FOIA request and I'll literally get hundreds of pages of consumer complaints. And you can tell from the complaints on like usually whether or not they're frivolous. Like you can see handwritten notes saying this company screwed me and here's all the documentation. 
you, you learn a lot reading these complaints and sometimes you can see companies responses and they, they can be telling like there was this one case I was researching like a used car dealership and they would rip off their customers by just like, like they, they'd get an unsophisticated customer, sell them a car worth $4,000 and charge them like $30,000. Complete out of this world rip off, just the most unethical thing. Wow. And this lady, you know, bought a car. She, she wrote her state attorney general saying, hey, I bought this car. I didn't know what I was doing. And they charged me 20 grand for like a $4,000 car. And then my friends showed me the Kelly Blue Book and I found out I got screwed off. Can you help me? The state attorney general sends the car dealership a letter being like, is this true? And now she has this like huge loan from you guys because you, you screwed her over on this car. And, and the, the, the company responds, the auto dealership responds and is like, um, yeah, like, yeah, we overcharged, but we upgraded the lights, we upgraded the engine, but, you know, to make this go away, we'll just forgive $15,000 of her loan. And it's mind boggling. Like wow. you're screwing over people and all they need to do is write a letter to a state attorney general and they get $50,000 waived off their loan. But it's also infuriating to see that in a company. And those are the companies I like to look into more. Was that a listed company or is that, or are you using that, that your knowledge? That was a publicly traded company. Wow. Um, I haven't written about them yet because, you know, sometimes things can get complicated, but I, I really, you know, I focus on companies that are either misleading investors or hurting consumers. One of my favorite metrics that no one ever talks about enough is customer satisfaction. My view is a company that has a lot of happy customers is worth a lot more than a company with unhappy customers, even if they have the fi same financial data because happy customers are gonna stay for longer. Happy customers you can raise prices on, which is gonna give you higher margins. Happy customers is gonna to lead to a lot of long-term success, while unhappy customers, you know, they're gonna churn faster. Even if the metrics look good now, a year from now, they're less likely to look good. So that's what I really like to focus on. And that's one of my frustrations when you see a lot of the Wall Street types is it's too much number focused and not enough on like the customer experience. So you'll dig through all that and read. So I, the, I focus a lot on that. So the, the Freedom of Information Act, how, how, do, you, how do you get a hold of this? I'm not, I'm, I wasn't aware of this. So, so you, there's some resources online. Uh, you, the typical way is you would go to uh, an organization like the FTC. If you just look at FTC Freedom of Information Act, there's probably a web form and an email address and a physical mailing address. Um, and all you need to do is like write an email saying, hi, I'm sending this email as a Freedom of Information Act request. I'm requesting all complaints filed with this division in the last two years that reference this company from this date to this date. That's kind of, I think, the standard way of doing it. Uh -huh. um, you know, you can go to the state level. I go to the state level a lot. Um, basically any federal agency or state government agency you can FOIA. At the state level, it varies state by state. Like some states let out of residence file, out of state residence file requests. Other states like Alabama say you need to be an Alabama citizen to file requests. Um, it's one area that I think, you know, it, a lot of sophisticated hedge funds file a lot of FOIAs, usually to like the FDA and SEC. Um, but a lot of individual investors, just by not knowing this resource exists, don't do it enough. It's also like the type of thing that makes sense if you're going to spend a thousand hours researching a company, but probably doesn't make sense if you're an individual with a portfolio of 50 companies. Gotcha. Wow, that's very helpful information. Um, okay, so what, what's, is there a specific sector that you like to research that you have a certain interest in? The biggest thing is that I can understand it. So uh, a drug development company, that's going to be probably too difficult for me. A very big financial institution, no one, even the CEO might not understand what's going on. Um, my sweet spot is one to $10 billion companies listed in the US, US based. Um, usually I like technology because technology is easier to understand or something that's consumer facing. So you're interacting a lot with consumers that makes my FOIA requests more relevant. Um, those are generally 
uh, the things I do. But 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 if, as long if you're hurting consumers or if you're misleading investors, I, I'd be interested. But typically, a company with, with a lot of consumers, probably tech based in some way, one to ten billion dollars U.S. market cap. And of course, I'm interested in a lot of the SPAC deals right now. Of course, the SPACs sometimes attract the worst of the worst. Yeah, that's that's going to give you a lot of material for a long time. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's. It, I got I got really lucky for a few reasons, uh, David. W one is that I started this during the pandemic when everybody was bored and looking for new stuff to read. I think that the pandemic's the perfect time to start a newsletter. Two, you got all these retail investors coming in, and retail investors are generally less sophisticated, which means there's more bad actors lying, and there's all these facts. So that means there's more. It's a target-rich environment to write about. Um, so so. Those are two things that made me really lucky, all these SPACs and doing this during the pandemic. Well, you know, it's it's uh, opportunity meets preparation meets opportunity, right? Because you, you've been like I was I first got a you got on my radar when before the pandemic. I yeah. Think, yeah. When did you, when did you start the bear cave? This must have been like 2019, 2018. No, no, no. no. So I was tweeting about like stocks before then. I was like um, t talking to people before then. But. Uh, I started the newsletter. Uh, I could be wrong about this, but I, I think like literally early March of 2020, like the week wow, before, so it's right. like, uh, you know, the pandemic got super serious. So yeah. I, 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 so, so that was like, you know, good timing because I also had a lot of free time I could put into the newsletter. So what was your reaction? Cause March was like that big, that big drop in the whole, uh, the whole market, right? Yes, yeah, so that was probably good for um, a good time to start a bearish newsletter. Yeah. Um, I just I just remember I was a senior in college. We all got sent home and I, I was fortunate that I could graduate a quarter early. So I didn't need to mess with these online classes. And I, I just remember thinking, oh, this is going to be over in a month. And like all these colleges are so overreacting and boy, was I wrong. Um, I, I, the moment it set in for me that it was real is when like the NBA started canceling games and I'm like, oh God. And then the most frustrating thing is all these stocks sold off during the pandemic, like overstock.com sold off from 20 to three. And I just remember I was seeing people tweet about it and I was like, they're trading at net cash and they're an online business, so they should do well during the pandemic. And I was like, I should invest a lot in them. And I didn't. And there's all these businesses that I could have invested in and made 30 times my money and I didn't. And that still stings me a bit. You know, but, um, I remember actually, yeah, back then you interviewed, I think, Mark Cahodes and he was saying something, uh, the camper stocks are going to go higher and all that. This is like right in the beginning of the pandemic and when that came out <clears throat> and they did those RV yeah, campers I, I, they actually went up like he was telling you right there <laughs> that was one Hodes, sometimes you know you hear things and they just click so i just remember he's like you know right now everybody's pandemic scared and camping world's trading low because they have a lot of debt but think in the summer camping is a perfect pandemic activity also campers use a lot of gas and gas prices are low and you usually finance the purchase of a camper and right now the interest rates are low so people will buy more campers and this is a very covid friendly activity in the long run and he's like, of course, you'd want to own like a levered camping stock, but the market is just haywire. So it's yeah. super cheap. And I'm just like, this makes a lot of sense to what you're saying, Mark. And the stock went from eight to 40. And, and, and you know, I find it kind of odd. There's like people like doing 20,000 word reports and super long things and all these modeling. And sometimes you just need something like that's intuitive. Yeah. At yeah. a time where people are getting it wrong. So understand why people are getting it wrong and then a, an intuitive reason why it's worth more. Yeah. Um, absolutely. I mean, hindsight, I remember, I remember that now when I was going through the, the interviews of your interviews before, before this interview, I was like, wow, Marco Hody's called that one. Um, okay, so what do you think, what are your thoughts on short selling being good for the market? Uh, I think generally it's a, it's a big positive. So the, there's kind of two camps when it comes to short sellers. There's people who just do it passively and don't write about it and don't go on TV and talk about it. And I, I think that's pretty good because 
They're going to be buyers when the market falls. So, so they help stabilize the market. And just good to have skeptics who are digging in and looking for potential misconduct, because if you don't have any skeptics, you're just going to have more misconduct and more red flags. Um, the people who I think can do a lot of real good are the people who short and publish research, as long as it's intellectually honest. Um, those are the people who, you know, if there's a bad company out there and that's lying to investors, you want it caught early, even though you might think, oh, it's hurting people if you send a stock down 50%. It, well, in the long run, it's going to help because if you didn't identify uh, some misconduct, then the company is going to have a higher share price. They're going to issue more shares. They're going to grow. They're going to become a $20 billion company before they collapse. So spotting fraud early, even if you send a stock down 100%, it's good to catch it early versus letting it develop. Um, so you really want those people, as long as they're right and intellectually honest, to identify problems. Now, sometimes with activist shorts, you can get a weird incentive going on where if you're covering the day after you put out a report, you might more of this incentive might be to, you know, spice up allegations, use a lot of exclamation points and red ink and say, oh, a company's on the brink of bankruptcy when it's not actually. Um, so you got to be, a, a, sometimes I'm a little wary of people who might be exaggerating claims. But for the most part, I, I think activist shorts do a lot of good in the world. Yeah, I agree completely. Um... So, okay, so what are your thoughts on the Chinese companies being listed in the U.S. exchanges? So I've never, I've never done a ton of super close work on China. It just, it just again, it's tough for, it would be tough for me because I don't read Chinese. I, it, there's not really foyable because all our customers are in China. Generally, I'm a huge skeptic though. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I've seen like a study on Chinese stock underperformance versus like US based companies, but I'm sure there's significant underperformance. Uh, the bigger thing is like a lot of times with just a little bit of diligence, you, you, you can get the sense that something's wrong. Like if they're using a really third rate auditor, then that's probably a red flag. A lot of the big ones have big auditors and also collapse. But, 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 but sometimes it's like, like there was this one I wrote about one smart education in China. And I think it was like a $500 million company a year and a half ago. And I just saw like they had three different CFOs in two years. One of their auditors resigned. The SEC like sent them a letter saying, hey, your enrollment figures don't make sense. And they're like, oh, that was a typo in our filings. And it's like, okay, this is like more than enough like red flags for an average person to be like, let's pass on this. But they were still an $800 million company and, and now they're a penny stock. And it's just like, there's just too much of this where, uh, and I think it's mostly retail driven is you completely believe in the numbers where, with the, you know, companies outside the US, you probably want a little more skepticism. Um, so I'd be bearish on uh, U.S. listed companies in China, from China. Yeah, um, I mentioned that because I saw your interview with Carson Block, and you mentioned that there's like 130 ADRs coming out of China on the U.S. exchanges, and then he was saying that most of them are, are frauds. You know, he was like rolling his eyes, he's, you know, in the interview. He's like, yeah, most of them are most likely frauds. Like, what was your, what was your reaction on that? Like, what, what, did that blow you away? So Carson, you know, understands this a lot better than I can ever possibly understand it. What he said is that even the ones that are like legitimate are probably inflating sales by 20 to 30%. And I found that really interesting that culturally it's like almost accepted to uh, inflate the numbers a bit. Where in the US that would totally not fly. Um, and that was his opinion. And I believe his opinion because he's definitely an expert in this. Uh, yeah, it, it was disappointing. It, it just made me say, like, let me stick to things I understand, which are like U.S. based tech companies. Um, uh -huh. that, because if you can't rely on rule of law and the numbers being right, then you really need to be a super great expert. So like the people who probably will do great in Chinese stock are people in China who understand how the government thinks, who can read all the Chinese filings, which sometimes have more information, who just understand the culture better there. Um, it, it just reinforced my notion is you don't want to be the dumb guy at the table. And if you're a small U.S. investor investing in Chinese companies, you're the dumb guy at the table um, and you don't want to be in that position.
Gotcha. So when you go into researching the companies, like uh, you read, like you mentioned, you read all the, the lawsuits and you dig into, do you have a background? In, uh, well, what did you study in school? And how did you get, how did you get into that? I studied economics, to be honest. I don't think it's that relevant to what I do now. I don't think any of what I yeah. studied in college is too relevant. But what is relevant and what I do that's helpful is I, I probably spend an hour or two reading like a ton of Wall Street Journal articles every day. At minimum, that teaches you how to write well and think skeptically. I follow like every investigative reporter covering finance. And, and sometimes if you read a lot, you can see like, how they approach researching things and thinking about things. I read a lot of the other activist short sellers and then you can kind of see how they approach things. I try to talk to people and do what you do, like ask people how they got started in their favorite research techniques. Um, I published about this a bit, but you know, SEC filings, people might read a 10K or 10Q or the 8K, but there's a lot of stuff that people miss, like there's comment letters, which is informal correspondence between the SEC and a public company. Those become public with a certain delay. I love reading those and those you find under like the, by typing in chorus for upload into the search filter for a company. Um, there's also a, a tool that I use a ton called the SEC full text search tool. It's a website, just Google SEC full text search and it allows you to put anything in quotes. It could be a name, it could be a company's name, it could be an executive, it could be an LLC, it could be a word in quotes. And you can literally see every time that word has appeared in any SEC filing for the last 20 years, which wow. is hugely helpful. So like, I'll take an executive's name, put his name in quotes, put it in the SEC full text search tool and bam, like it's going to be more comprehensive than even a Bloomberg terminal. I can see if he was a board member of any company, a shareholder of any company, if, if his brother with the same last name was involved in any company, you can see so much. Um, that's probably one of the tools I think is like very underused. Wow. So, all right. So I, I'm a, I'm a trader, right? I'm a short selling trader. And like, I've yeah. learned from others. I have, I had a couple mentors. I paid for classes, or I guess I've, books, all these things I've accumulated over time. How did you learn how to do this? Like, that's how I learned. And I learned baptism under fire as well, right? How did you learn? So, how did I'm you a very this curious you... person. I, I like to learn. I read a ton. I, when I was in college, the one nice thing about being a college student is everybody has sympathy for you and is willing to talk. I reached out to everybody and I'd always ask them like, what do you do in the first hour of research? What do you do that other people don't do? And by doing this with everybody, I got everybody's secret. It's and it kind of became like the person who knows everybody's little secret research techniques. And then, you know, I don't mind sharing them. I, I definitely think like, Sometimes people are like, oh, keep information close to you so it doesn't get out. I think generally it's, you know, it's fine to share and make other people smarter and they like you for it. Um, but, but I just learned a lot by reading a lot and talking to a lot of people. And then like, then how much does like your imagination come into play? Like, for example, how you did the care.com. Like you just like something clicks and you're like, okay, uh, what if I do this? Let me just set up a profile <laughs> as I, I, I the worst guy in the world. <laughs> being creative helps. Um, so sometimes you, you know, you, you, you just, sometimes if you're an outsider. So the one benefit to me is I didn't have a, a ton of formal training. So when you're an outsider, you see things differently and you can view things like differently. So like most hedge funds stop at the federal level and they go to the FTC. And I was like, well, where else would people send complaints on a company? Well, they could go to their state attorney general. So why don't I try a state attorney general? And I did that for care.com in Massachusetts. And literally they sent me like 160 pages of consumer complaints. And I'm like, huh, this is really cool. And like, no one does it. so. Um, but, but, but by being an outsider and almost being naive and blind to the way all the hedge funds usually do it, you can find like, you know, new ways of thinking about things. Now, th that amount of complaints, is that like an extraordinary amount? Yeah, if a, if a company has like 150 pages of complaints against them over a two year period, that's a very high amount for a state attorney general. It also depends on the company. So if it's a billion dollar company, that's high. If it's like a MasterCard or Visa or like a Facebook, those are huge companies that interface with millions and millions of people. So 150 pages might not be high in that context. The quality of complaint 
matters a lot. If it's like, oh, like, you know, I forgot to cancel this and I tried to cancel this and they wouldn't give me a refund. That's unfortunate, but that's not super severe. But like with care.com, I saw a case where a, a woman has been like, you know, they keep billing me. I called to cancel. I emailed to cancel. They won't cancel. They keep billing me. I cut up my credit card. They somehow started charging my husband's credit card. I sent them a wow. letter. I talked to a lawyer. And now I'm writing you, state attorney general, because they find ways to bill me for the last five years. And there's no way for me to cancel. And it's like, that's pretty messed up. And like, you know, that is a very low quality source of revenue because that is not sustainable. It's going to go away and you're clearly pissing off customers. That's not something that should trade at 10x revenue. Absolutely. Can't agree with you more with that one. All right. So um, moving on. So what are your thoughts on short squeezes? Do you think short selling can be more efficient or is it good how it is? Uh, uh, my, my big thing is I like off the beaten path shorts. So you, there's a lot of group think in wall street. And I think a lot of time hedge funds talk to other hedge funds and they're like, oh, this company's going bankrupt. Let's all short this retailer. I, I, I think there needs to be more individualistic thinkers. Um, I, 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 I you know, historically people say the data show heavily shorted stocks underperform, but heavily shorted stocks also have a ton of short squeezes. So you can't make them big positions. I would, I always look for stocks, with low short interest that no one talks about that are super, super sleepy. Like one of my favorite recent reports, I wrote about this company called Medical Properties Trust. They're a $10 billion REIT in Alabama and like 2% of their shares are shorted. And who's gonna like, you know, I, I always think, could this company 10X, or 3x in a month. So like something like a, a heavily shorted retailer could do that. Something like an AMC could do that. Will medical properties trust this healthcare REIT in Alabama ever become like a Reddit meme stock? No. Will it ever be short squeezed? No. Okay, well now that now that's like it passes my two criteria. I'd love to dig in more. That's not always the case. Sometimes I'll write about something that has like a higher short interest if I think I, I have some new information on it or there's something the market's missing. But generally I try for the off the beaten path stuff. Great, great. Um, all right, so any fundamentals you look at as far as dilution or any red flags like that? You know, I probably should, but I, I kind of view what I do as m almost more journalistic than just financial analysis. So, you know, I'll, I'll see if they have a lot of debt that's maturing soon. That could be a, a really good thing to, if you're critical on a company, I'll look at the balance sheet. Um, but, but honestly, that's like a lot less of my focus and it keeps becoming less and less of my focus. It's more about understanding the business. Um, you know, I, I'll look for like a changes in revenue recognition. One thing I always look for is how do they recognize revenue, particularly for smaller companies or companies with bad auditors. You might see that they changed over time, their revenue recognition policy, that could be a red flag. You can see uh, if other companies, their peers use the same revenue recognition policy. And if they don't, you might be like, hmm, that's a little weird. Uh, so, so, so finding patterns like that is where I'm strong. Like, oh, this company uses a weird revenue recognition policy. They've had three different CFOs and a bad auditor. Something's probably up. Uh, I'm less digging into the balance sheet. Like uh, for, for companies that are losing money, I always try to think how much runway do they have left? Um, but no, I don't, I, I, don't I, I don't spend too much time looking at the financials. It's probably like 10 minutes in total. <laughs> Gotcha. Um, okay. And what services or websites do you use to quickly process what's going on with the stock? Uh, give me one second on that. I'm going to, I just published something about good websites. One of my, so, so SEC full text search, SEC Edgar is huge. Uh, I borrow desk is a free website that gives borrow rates and how it changes over time. Shortsqueeze.com is free data on short interest. One of my favorite tools, they're like kind of in beta testing is the ticker. It's kind of like a Bloomberg terminal, but a lot cheaper. And it can give you the financial data, the earnings transcripts, the chart, everything at a glance. The ticker is quickly becoming like my favorite tool to use. Um, 
if you go to the Bear Cave newsletter's website, there's an article, 100 Must Follow Financial Twitter Accounts. And at the bottom is a link you can use to sign up for the ticker. Because right now, I think if you go to the ticker's website, it's like invite only. Um, but the ticker is one of my favorites. Um, and then it's a paid tool, but insider score. I like that to like track management changes. Gotcha. Wow, that's that's a lot of useful information there. I'm pretty sure people are going to be rewinding to hear that a couple of <laughs> times. <laughs> um, okay, what? How do you size into a trade if you decide to partake in a short report? And do you use one block size or work around the core, etc.? So I don't short the companies I write about, but on the long side, uh, my, I'm definitely a concentrated person. Right now, 70% of my net worth, maybe even 75%, is in Twitter stock and Twitter call options. Because if you believe in something and you're young and you can afford to lose the money, I, I totally think it's okay to go big. Um, so, so, so usually, I, and I usually, it, it's less. I size into it when I have conviction in it. And it's less about whether the stock is going up or down. If I have conviction, I'm gonna bet a lot. Usually I think it's totally okay to average up. Like I've been buying Twitter, I bought some Twitter stock when it was at 30, when it was at 40, when it's at 50, when it's at 60, when it's at 70. And I'll probably be buying more at 80, 90 and 100, as long as I think like the product rollouts are going as I expect. Um, so, so I'm, I'm probably different than most people because I don't day trade a lot. I think you get tons of advantages by being concentrated and not turning over too much. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I think about a little like whether or not it makes sense to use leverage. When I was young, I always thought, oh, leverage is like terrible. But as you get older, if you have a different source of income other than trading, I think it's okay to use like a few months worth of leverage because you could pay it down quickly. Um, but, but right now, uh, tw basically my trading strategy is earn money and buy Twitter stock with the money I earn with a little bit of margin from Robinhood. And that might sound silly, but if Twitter's at 500 in four years, like I'll be laughing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you want to, I was looking at your, your Twitter page. You mentioned that, like you were comparing, uh, I glanced at it. You were comparing it Twitter to as opposed to Snapchat or Instagram or something. Can you go over that just to make a little case for Twitter? I would love to, David. So Twitter is very unique when it comes to social media in that it is so, so, so under monetized. Uh, with other social media, you know, you might be able to fit a little more added ads in or charge more for ad rates. But I, I think most of it is, you know, pretty well monetized. Twitter's the opposite. Twitter's monetization has been horrible and there's so much room to improve. And most importantly, management is rolling out a bunch of new tools to improve the monetization. The thing I'm most excited about is called super follows, which means that any account with more than 10,000 followers that, you know, is run by somebody over 18 years of age can say, hey, if you like my free content on Twitter, super follow me through Twitter. You get private spaces, you get private tweets, private spaces, and more interaction with me. So for five, 10, $20 a month, you know, you get more of me. I think that is going to be super, super um, successful with online creators like myself. Because what people don't realize is I write an email newsletter. Over half my audience comes from Twitter. That's true for almost any email newsletter. You need to grow through Twitter. So, of course, I'd like to be able to sell something directly on Twitter or sell my newsletter through Twitter. Twitter is the perfect way for creators to stay close with their audiences, especially after spaces. It just doesn't work on Facebook or LinkedIn or Snapchat. Snapchat, Twitter's the way to go. So, so Twitter with super follows is going to become almost a royalty on the creator economy because all online creators are going to try to monetize their following through Twitter super follows. It's just better than any of the alternatives, but that that's in beta testing right now and it should come out fully in the next month or two or so. So I, I, I think once Wall Street catches on, you know, that'll be a big thing. Uh, I think Twitter's other new services like Twitter Blue, their subscription service that they're testing in Australia and Canada. I think that's going to be super successful because I personally am going to sign up in a heartbeat. There's a lot of Twitter super fans who just want to get a little more utility out of Twitter. Uh, the bottom line is there's going to be a lot of people like me who earn a ton 
through Twitter right now, going to be paying Twitter 50 grand, 100 grand a year, two years from now to either advertise my newsletter through super follow fees, through ticketed spaces, things like that. And then the final thing is I think Twitter has a lot of room with e-commerce that they're starting to test now. Um, where once you get people's credit card info, if they sign up for a super follows or ticketed spaces or Twitter blue, you can enable like one click shopping for e-commerce saying, hey, here's an ad for something, buy it in one click, we have your address, we'll ship it to you. Uh, I, I think that can be super successful because Twitter has a ton of data on users. Um, I, I'm less sure about e-commerce. The thing that excites me most about Twitter is super follows. Uh, and, and then the key thing here is Twitter trades at a dirt cheap multiple like 10x revenue when all these other social media companies are 20, 30x. But Twitter has a ton of room to improve monetization. How is the one that with the most room for growth and the highest growth rate growing forward, in my opinion, trading at the lowest multiple? It should be at the highest multiple. But because they haven't done a great job executing on monetization in the past, it trades at a lower multiple. But if you just look, Jack Dorsey, when he took over six years ago, the first thing he did is get a lot of new management in. Like the new head of product, Kayvon Baker-Poor is A+, but he's only been there since 2018. He changed the culture at Twitter. He improved the health of the conversation. And now they're focused on monetization. And I just think it's going to become wildly profitable over the next 12 months. And I think Twitter, 12 months from now, it's going to have the credit card info on tens of millions of users and allow them with one click to buy a Twitter blue subscription, become a super follower, sign up for a ticketed space or do an e-commerce transaction. And that's just going to be wildly popular on the platform. Wow. That's going to, that's some really good insight. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to reflect back on it in the future. I'm pretty sure you want to start roll out those stuff and they see the price increasing. We look back on this interview and be like, wow, Edwin called it. <laughs> like, hopefully. yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Right. So, um, okay. So what, Okay, so how do you find the companies to research? Do you get tips from people? Uh, so a lot, I would say probably the majority come just organically. I might be on Twitter and see something somebody tweets and be like, hmm, that's interesting. I might read something that piques my interest. I, I proactively read SEC comment letters and just read stuff to try to find new ideas. Sometimes a reader will say, look at an industry or look at a specific company and I'll run with that. You know, sometimes people will say this executive is really fishy and I might look at where this executive has worked at in the past. So, so I would say half are like true, complete organic. The other half could have some sort of, sort of reader. Um, it could be a tip on, on a company, on an industry, on something. Somebody like sent me a spreadsheet of all these SPAC deals. And I just looked through the spreadsheet and I'm like, let me find the ones that are suspicious. So uh -huh. I find them from all sources. Definitely the ones I prefer are organic ones that I find myself because those ones are more likely to be off the beaten path. If you're getting a tip from somebody, then odds are a lot of people know about it. Gotcha. Okay. So when you first started, what was like your biggest aha moments starting out with a newsletter or as an activist with a newsletter? Just the, just the people signing up for paid subscriptions. Like I remember when I launched it, like the first day there was like $13,000 of revenue, which was kind of low because I was expecting more. And I'm like, Oh, it's going to be a failure because the run rate is like $20,000 a year. But then after I put out the first paid report, just right away, like it hit, it hit, it hit, it hit 100 grand in revenue, like annualized revenue within two months. And it's just going to grow from there. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is working way better than I could imagine. So so th th that's what kind of surprised me. And that's when I knew it would be successful, just when people started signing up. And it turns out like hedge funds are really cost insensitive. And if there's going to be something that makes them go hmm or think or learn, they'll pay for it. And they're less likely to cancel because it's like, you know, a, a nothing for them. So a, this was an untested model. I had no idea if it would work. And, and it turns out it worked well. Yeah, no, it's great material you put out. And the way you put it out is very, it's, it's it's clean. It's organized. It's it's concise. It's 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 good. It's good. Um, most people think you can only make money in the hedge fund research space by like charging twenty grand or fifty grand a year. And like it turns out that a lot of people will just put their credit card info in for something for forty four dollars a month if they get a tip or if they think it'll help them. 
All right. So, uh, okay. So what are your thoughts on the current market conditions for short sellers? I, I think the key is avoid anything that can be a meme stock, anything that has like the potential to three X in two months and avoid the crowded names. Just stick with the boring off the beaten path stuff and you'll probably do better. I think in a lot of these D SPACs, you, you could do well. If I, if I was running a fund like and was focused on like more short-term trading or stuff that would last less than a year, um, I would probably be like trying to go long a lot of the good and mediocre SPACs and short the bad SPACs. Because I think retail is a tough, like investors just have a tough time differentiating right away. But over time, the results prove like, you know, who has the beef, where's the beef. So uh, the best opportunity I think is to go long legit SPACs or like good, good companies merging with SPACs and go short all the garbage. Great. Okay. So what, all right. So what is your most memorable trade or ticker? I guess you don't trade. So what is your most memorable name? The care.com thing care .com. is definitely, definitely the most memorable. That, that was just so exciting. And just to, just to get, I got my name got in the wall street journal, which was like a dream come true. Yeah. Um, and just knowing that I made a difference with it, that, that I was really happy. How was it on the Stanford campus at that time? Like, did people know that you were doing this? Oh, people uh, knew. People knew. People also knew I got in beef with the administration. So, you know, I think I later went to one of the Stanford newspapers and I was like, look, look, they tried to stop me. And that got some press. So I definitely became one of the more controversial and better known kids <laughs> when I was there. But yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah. What hobbies or routines do you have outside of the markets? Great question. I, I love that question, David. Uh, um, I just read a ton. Right now I'm reading a book about Clarence Darrow, who's a famous lawyer in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And I really like that book. Um, I'm interested in law. I, I, I watch a lot of weird legal videos. One of my favorite YouTube channels is Legal Eagle. I just like to read journalism and then hang out with my friends. The, the, I guess the, the, that might sound weird, but like, you know, I, I honestly have a lot of free time being self-employed with the newsletter. And I, I like to spend my time reading in the sun and just hanging out with people I find interesting. That's great. And, and you're in New York right now? All right. I just moved to a new apartment in New York City and I'm thrilled to be here and I'm always looking to meet new people. So anyone in New York who's interesting should DM me or email me. That's cool. So, so you came going from California to New York. Yeah, I, oh. I, I've moved around a lot um, when I was young. I was born in Philly. I moved to Chicago. I moved back to Philly. My family moved to Rochester, then to Baltimore, then back to Rochester. Then I go oh. all the way to Stanford, and then I go to New York City. So, so I'm, now I'm ready to settle down, and I'm done with the moving. But <laughs> Wow. Okay, well, that's exciting, New York City. That's pretty cool. Okay, so all right, so where do you see yourself in the future with – in the markets with markets in general that's tough you know if, if you asked me this two years ago i would have said hopefully running a hedge fund now I, i've become almost disillusioned with the markets like after a certain point how much you earn has like no impact on your quality of life so i might start a hedge fund or try to like generate publicity and a following that i could use to start a hedge fund uh, I could, I could, I could see myself becoming more of an activist where I use the bear cave. I, I still write the news that are earns money. I highlight bad companies, but also get involved in social causes, like a private company that's screwing people over or things that are just wrong and unjust in society and kind of being like a quasi journalist in a way where I'm writing about, you know, these companies that are bad and I'm earning money from subscriptions, but I'm also writing about stuff in society that's bad that I'd like to change. Who knows? Or maybe I'll lose my soul and become like a hedge fund manager focused on making money. But I, I honestly hope that's not the path I go down. I, I like to joke with people. If I had two lives, I would spend one of the lives making up billions of dollars running a hedge fund. But if you only have one life, I'm not sure that's the best way to live it. But either way, you're you're a young guy, and with the, I think you have a bright future. You know, whichever path you take, I don't. Know, maybe you become the hedge fund guy. Maybe you become the activist short seller for a good cause. Uh, either way, you're you're really bright. So it's exciting to see in the future where you're going to be at. Um, at least for me, I'm 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 excited to see that. Thank you, um, David. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so, so what is the favorite interview? We're going to start to wrap this up now. So what is your favorite interview that you've done? 
Ooh, that's a good one. There's been so many. Uh, probably one with Anthony Pompliano because that just got a ton of views. He has a huge audience and he's a different type of interviewer where he's very fast on the fly and he, he interviews a person every day. So he knows how to like conduct an interview well and like change topics and shift gears. So probably the one I did with Anthony Pompliano. Where can the we Pomp find that one? Is that is that on YouTube? Yeah, it's just the Pomp Podcast. Pomp Podcast. The Pomp Podcast, okay. Cool, yeah, I wanna, I wanna check that one out too. All right, so um, any book recommendations? Uh, in finance, Bad Blood, the story about Theranos was really good. GE Lights Out was really good. I found the best report, the best books are former Wall Street Journal reporters or Wall Street Journal reporters writing books about the companies they cover because they just know so much and they just like, they'll understand it better than anyone in the world. So this book about WeWork coming out is on my list. And then I highly recommend people read about Clarence Darrow. He's a fascinating lawyer. Um, I'm reading his biography, Clarence Darrow, Attorney for the Damned. Just a very interesting person and one of my heroes. So that's another person I like to read about. Wow. Awesome. I'm going to check all those out. All right. And uh, lastly, so what is your favorite podcast, YouTube, any audio books? Ooh. So uh, Twitter, Mark Cajotes, everybody should follow him on Twitter. Wall Street Cynic is another good Twitter account. Honestly, if people are looking to learn, the best thing they can do is make a Twitter account and file, follow a lot of these great Twitter personalities that are like educating about stocks and researching companies. Um, I, I just published a list of the 100 best Twitter accounts to follow that's on the barricade. I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. So everybody should go check that out, out if they're looking to learn. Um, I like this YouTube channel called Legal Eagle. Uh, I learn a lot about law there. Yet another value podcast is a good podcast that just like in interviews investors. Uh, that's a great one to watch. Um, but Twitter and yet another value podcast. Those are the two big takeaways. Wow. Thanks for all that inside knowledge uh, and value. Okay. So yeah, so that sums everything up. Edwin, thank you so much for hanging out with the Friendly Bear podcast. Um, I'll have all your info in the show notes for everyone to see. I'll try to get all those books on there as well listed and stuff that you mentioned. And thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I hope to keep in touch with you in the future and uh, keep an eye out for your, all your newsletters. Yeah, David, thanks so much. I, I really enjoyed doing this and please do DM me your email and I'll add you to the bear cave pay tier so you can start getting the stuff. Um, and if you could DM me when it comes out, um, please let okay. me know. Uh, and, and I really enjoyed this. You're a nice, bubbly guy, smart guy. So I'm excited to see what you do with this podcast. Absolutely, man. Thanks a lot, everyone. You have a great day. Thank you okay, for tuning you in. Okay, you too, David. All right, bye.